Well, good evening. I, uh, I just finished listening to a, a very good message. I blessed my heart and I appreciated what I heard uh, on fear uh, from uh, basically Lamentations 3, 57. Um, we're going to continue on that subject. It's funny that earlier this, this evening, uh, the pastor and associate pastor and myself were just uh, discussing, and we thought we could probably preach on the same verse of Scripture and bring three different messages. And that's what's so exciting about the Word of God. It ever changes. It's always applicable to the situation. And that's what's so fascinating about it. So we're going to continue even though this might not be in the same series, but we're going to continue on that subject. We're going to continue on the subject of not a spirit of fear. Let's pray. Father, we are truly thankful for the opportunity to fill this pulpit. It's not an honor that's taken lightly. It's a privilege. It's a privilege to be called of God to preach the gospel of God. And we do not take that lightly. Father, may there be some this evening that may not know Christ, and this might present to them an opportunity to uh, stimulate their thought with respect to what the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary for them. And if they wish to inquire that uh, they would do so at the numbers that are given on the various sites that we deal with. We would ask that they would give us a call, let us know that they have received Christ, or ask and, let us, and tell us that a specific message was a blessing to them. Bless us now, Father. Be with us tonight. May the Lord bless each of us. May the Lord give me the spirit to present the gospel of Christ. Thank you, and we do pray in Jesus' name. Everybody, at one time or another, has entertained fear. Whether they wish to admit it or not, they have. Many of those fears are referred to as phobias, Psychiatry identifies three different categories of these phobias. One's an agoraphobia, which is in irrational, totally irrational anxiety about being in a place from which you might not be able to escape, or a place that you might be embarrassed being found in. I, I happen to think of a couple of instances of illustration like this. Uh, for instance, I, um, in my secular life, worked with a gentleman that had a fear of being in a small room, and he would not go into a bank vault unless he could stand right next to the door. He wanted a means of escape to get out, and subsequently we didn't do too many bank projects. And also, I had the privilege, in a sense, of, of uh, traveling with him a little bit. And uh, uh, once upon a time, we went to Disneyland, and we got on one of those roller coasters, except for him. He would not get on the roller coaster, because there was no way off. So he would not get on there. He was afraid of being in a place from which he could not escape. So he had agoraphobia. There's another one that's called a social phobia. Again, an irrational anxiety that's elicited by the exposure to certain types of social uh, or performance type situations. Uh, this also leads to avoidance. We don't want to get into that situation because we're afraid of it. I once upon a time uh, took a friend of mine bowling. 
who this person was an excellent bowler and had trophies and everything else, but had been away from it for a period of time, been out of the loop, not bowled in quite some time, and had lost confidence in their ability. Well, we arrived at the alley. We went in and got our shoes and put our shoes on and picked out the bowling ball. Of course, this party particularly had their own bowling ball. But anyway, we did all the proper preparations to bowl. And we sat down in the lane. We paid our fees. We sat down, and it was this person's turn to bowl. First time, first start out, and they refused to get up because they were afraid of being embarrassed. And they, out of fear, refused to bowl. So I had to pay the fees and leave. But that is a social phobia. And then there's a specific phobia, which is persistent and irrational fear when you are confronted with a specific stimulus, which often elicits avoidance of that particular stimulus. Retreat, escape, anything. There is a common phobia, sometimes referred as, to as herptophobia. Herptophobia, fear of reptiles, but more specifically, fear of snakes. Then there's another kind of phobia, which is called a cyanophobia, which is fear of dogs. The word kion, actually, in, in, the, in the Greek language is dog. And then the phobia, of course, is fear. So that's fear of the dogs. And I do fear some dogs on occasion, but that's only when they're after me. Now, here's uh, one that most of us have experienced probably at one time or another. Have you ever heard of things going bump in the night? Have you ever walked in a, in a dark cemetery with no particular outside source of light and you think there's somebody hiding behind every stone and tree? That's called nyctophobia, or fear of the dark. That's quite common for children. And also, some, to some degree, adults, I, I, I can confess to the fact that I probably possessed that at one time. Um, very small, I would probably think I was maybe in first or second grade and my mother took me to a film and it happened to be The Wizard of Oz and of course the scary wizards, or wiz witches actually. And when I got home that night of course, I saw the film. I, Mom told me I sat on the floor for most of the film. But when I got home at night, we had a thunderstorm. And I slept under the blankets so nobody could get me. And I held that posture under those blankets, sleeping until I was 15 years old. Fears, fears are real. Howard Hughes is, was, was an eccentric, and he was probably one of the wealthiest men of his time, but he had a fear. He had a phobia. It was called germophobia. He was afraid of germs. He was afraid of not being clean. There is a story that tells us that one time he actually uh, slept in a hotel room totally devoid of any clothing, and he was in his safe spot. No germs could get him. I think I read that he had a frame of about six foot four inches, and when he died, he weighed 90 pounds. He had a phobia. He was afraid of germs. You might know of Howard Mandel. You've probably seen him if you've watched any TV, and I, I know a lot of us don't, but I have heard the name Howard Mandel, and I have seen him. He's uh, commonly recognized as being the host of, the, of a hit game show called Deal or No Deal. That was a while back. I think he's on either 
You know, remember, it's either on the voice or that other one. I can't remember which one it is, but I don't, I don't pay attention to it. But otherwise, he suffers from mysophobia. Same thing, called fear of germs. He will not shake your hand. And you can see that on several occasions, that, that he refuses to shake hands with, with the contestant or whatever it might be. The point is, to all of this explanation, and you say, boy, is this boring. The point is here that we all have fear. We all possess fears. Whether we want to confess to that fear or not, whether we want to fess up, we do have fears. Now I want to draw your attention to a particular verse of text that I'm going to use, and this is the only text. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Chapter 1, verse 7 of 2 Timothy. You may know this. 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 7. You, you at home, if you have your Bibles, you certainly can look along with us and follow along as we uh, read and, and study this particular portion. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Fear is real, I agree. But this scripture tells us that God has not given us the spirit of fear. Basically, scripturally speaking, without getting all involved in a study of the word fear, there are two basic kinds of fear. One is respect or reverence either towards God or towards a, a person of, of great honor or power, one or the other, typically. Respect or reverence, we respect, we uh, live in awe of God. We respect who he is, we respect what he tells us. And the other one is a phobia that would be a terror or anxiety that many times would be considered un, unwarranted concern or worry. That is the other type. And that's basically the two that are present there. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Uh, oftentimes, we don't think of this as being in reference to a phobia. And this is what Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 says. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Paul is telling us here to avoid worry, avoid concern, avoid anxiousness, avoid being Paranoia, avoid being fearful. That's what he's telling us. He's saying, be careful for nothing. Don't be afraid. Don't worry. Why? And he tells us why. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies, my foes, come upon me to eat my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. And that's found in Psalms chapter 27, verses 1 to 3. So fear, fear is, is uh, certainly real. We all have experienced it. We know about it. Fear is not only just real, but fear is debilitating. It could render us useless. Fear and failure to trust God and to keep, kept, I should say, the Israelites out of the promised land. Forty years they spent wandering about in the wilderness because they were afraid 
to cross the river. Just because they were told that these were some big guys over there. And that you're not going to beat them. Even though God said, the land is yours. They were fearful. They were paranoid. They were afraid to go. Fear has kept soldiers from entering into the face of battle. Frozen in their foxholes. Afraid that they might die. There's a little bit of humor here. We need this a little bit. There's, there's a strain of goats that, uh, that freeze up. They become immobile when, they're, when they get excited and fearful. Uh, they play dead. They're called the Tennessee meiotic goats, believe it or not. We know them more as fainting goats. It's a good thing they're domestic goats. Because when the lion comes and the goat sees the lion and he locks up and falls over and plays dead, free lunch. So it's a good thing they're domestic. But they, their fear controls them to such a degree is that they freeze and they collapse. So it's debilitating. Fear is debilitating. Not only that, but fear is not of God. Fear is not of God. Believers can be sure that fear does not come from God. The verse says, God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Fear comes, the only fear that comes from God is the, is the fear of God, the respect for God, the awe of God, the I want to say almost appreciation of God. It, we, we respect him. Hmm. The only fear is from, you know, from God and the fear of sin. And also, I'm sorry, the other fear is the fear of sinning against God. Sinning against God. Fear is not the voice of God. It's the voice of the enemy. And that's a quote that I borrowed from David Cloud, who is a missionary in South Asia, and he's been planting churches there since uh, 1979. And I, 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 I thought that was a good statement on his part. A.W. Tozer said that uh, fear is of the flesh, is panic of the devil. Fear is of the flesh, and panic is of the devil. Psalms 56, verses 3 and 4 say this. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do to me. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 57 tells us, Thou drewest near in the day that I called upon thee. Thou saidst, Fear not. Fear not. Fear is not of God. Fear is real, but it's not from God. Fear is defeated how? Through God. Not the spirit of fear, the Verse that we looked at said, it's not the spirit of fear, but of power. God gives the believer strength and encouragement in every situation and every trouble that he might encounter. It's a special word. And in other messages, we talked about this word. The word is dunamis. It's the word we get dynamite from. Dynamite. The power of the explosion of the dynamite. It's translated in often cases mighty works or, or mighty abilities or miracles or strength and might. It's a dunamis power. It is the power to do God's will. It is the strengthening of the inner man by God's spirit. And then in the day when I cried, thou answerest me. 
and strengthenest me with strength in my soul. That's Psalms 138, verse 3. No, fear is defeated through God. Not the spirit of fear, but of power. Not the spirit of fear, but of love. This is the love of God which motivates the believer to serve him and to endure trials which frequently do come our way. This refers to the believer's love for God and the believer's love for his fellow man. Love is the opposite of self-concern, which is often the cause of fear, self-concern. Oh, what's going to happen to me? It turns one's attentions away from a self-focus to God and to others. Love. If I love God and if I love people, I will not draw back from the works of the ministries. If that's your calling and you love God and you love people, you will remain in the work of the ministry, regardless of the difficulties. The love of God is victory over fear. Not only is it not the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, but it's also the spirit of, not the spirit of fear, but of a sound mind. The word means discipline, self-control. A wise, quieted, disciplined mind that looks beyond difficulties and vain imaginations and fears and trusts in God. A mind that weighs the situations of life wisely according to the will of God. A mind that sees things clearly in the light of the word of God. Sound mind is the opposite of the mind that is shaken and troubled with unbelieving fear. The sound, it is a sound mind that overcomes fear. God's in control. God has given us promises that he cannot lie. The devil is a defeated foe. When shadows fall and night covers all, there are things that my eyes cannot see. I never fear, for my Savior is near. My Lord abides with me. When I am alone and I face the unknown and I fear what the future may be, I can depend on the strength of my friend. He walks along with me. Jesus is king. He controls everything. He is with me each night and each day. I trust my soul to my Savior's control. He drives all fear away. How can I fear? Jesus is near. He ever watches over me. Worries all cease. He gives me peace. How can I fear with Jesus? We have this pandemic, this COVID-19 that has us worried and concerned and fearful and all of the above. But, and, and, and I'm not dismissing COVID-19. It's real. It's out there. And I think it's wise and it's prudent that we take the precautions that are suggested by people who know better than we, supposedly, and it's wise for us to follow them. Now, media has done its very best to dramatize and subsequently to magnify the fear and create even more panic than we already see in the streets and in our marketplaces. We talked about lack of Gatorade and TP. Um, I don't know why we concentrate on those two items, but we are. The food shelves are bare. The stock market's fallen through. I think it's partially because the media has worked us into a frenzy. When in truth, probably more people have died in the past from flu and influenza, certainly from wars, natural disasters, earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, tsunamis, and we cannot ignore 
the number of babies that have died because of abortion. In general, and certainly for all of us who are believers, fear is of the world, and it's a product of Satan. Now, if we exhibit more fear of God, reverence and respect, and less fear of the world, Satan's playground, and less fear of man in his unregenerate state, then we'd be a lot better off as Christians. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Heavenly Father, bless us again. A brief message. Perhaps it speaks to some hearts. It is the message that you have laid upon my heart. You have asked me to deliver it, and I have done so. Father, I pray that you would use it. Touch hearts and lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we do pray. Amen.